I want to talk to you all today about an epiphany that I had. Growing up, I was blessed to have parents who were extremely hardworking. Both my parents were school teachers, and they had to stretch their incomes to feed and to clothe me and my brothers and my sister. We were a family that was rich with love for one another, but no one would have called us financially rich. My parents, they made ends meet, but there was never, never much left over. So if I wanted anything beyond the basic essentials, I couldn't do what my own kids do today, what my 14-year-old did just earlier this week and yell, Alexa, order new sneakers. <laughs> the fact is, if I wanted new shoes, I had to get a job. And job opportunities were limited in rural Southern Maryland, where I grew up. But I was determined to get my pair of Air Jordans. So like many Americans, for me, a top priority was figuring out how to generate income. Now, I may look like an airline pilot. <laughs> and on occasion, I've been asked for headphones and extra snacks while traveling. <laughs> But I stand before you today as the 20th United States Surgeon General. The very same Surgeon General whose warning label is on the side of every box of cigarettes sold in this country. So, can any of you guess what I did as a teenager to afford those sneakers? Close, close. I worked in the Southern Maryland tobacco fields. And the irony, it's not lost on me. I know from the murmurs in the audience what you're thinking. Our Surgeon General had a job that was harmful to the health of so many people. Even back then as a teenager, you had to know that tobacco was bad for you. Well, I watched my own grandfather suffer and die from lung cancer. I had asthma myself growing up, and one of my worst ever attacks came after working in a barn full of tobacco leaves hung out to dry. So, of course, I knew tobacco wasn't healthy. But I didn't connect the dots between a desire to meet my financial needs, in this case, obtaining the hottest new footwear, and the impact my actions would have on the health of millions of Americans, including me and my family. You see, Democrat or Republican, black or white, rich or poor, we all make decisions every day that compromise our future physical, and mental well-being. We do it as individuals, and we do it as a nation. And time and again, what we tend to prioritize is our financial well-being. And I actually see some heads in the audience shaking, no, 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 not me. So I ask you this. Raise your hand if sometime in the last week you didn't get enough sleep, you skipped a meal, you failed to work out for the sake of your school or your job. <laughs> And I'm betting that for many of you who raised your hands, at least part of your motivation was that you'd eventually be compensated, that you'd get a paycheck for making that choice. And if I ask you, what's healthier, french fries or broccoli? Broccoli, broccoli she got it. And if I ask you, <laughs> How many hours of sleep should you get a night? Last night, about five. Well, not how many hours you got, how many hours you should get. Eight. Eight, all right, see? You all are a smart group. You're a smart group. <laughs> see, you aced the test. The fact is, in most cases, you know what will make you and will make your community healthier, but you still choose not to do it. So why is there such a disconnect? And what can we all do about it? While you ponder that, let's fast forward to my life after rural Maryland when I became a practicing physician in Indiana. I worked in an inner city hospital. I was very proud of the work I did, but if I'm going to be honest with you, I was also starting to get a little bit burned out. Late one night, I remember a young man 
Let's call him Johnny, who came in with multiple gunshot wounds. I worked with Johnny all night long, giving him unit after unit of blood. By the end of it all, there was more of Johnny's blood on me than there was in his own body. Johnny survived, but I saw Johnny again a year later with a stab wound. Johnny even came back a third time a few years after that. Time and again, we'd see people like Johnny in the hospital as a result of gang-related violence. We'd patch them up, but then we'd send them back out into environments that led them to us in the first place. And I told you all that I had asthma. I vividly remember a patient who was having an asthma attack. Let's call her Mary. Mary was having such a hard time getting oxygen to her brain that she was losing consciousness. I had to put a tube down Mary's throat and breathe for her on a mechanical ventilator for several days. Mary thankfully recovered, but guess what? We sent her back to a housing complex that was filled with secondhand smoke. You see, no matter what I did as a healthcare provider, I couldn't stop the treatment from being needed again or the trauma from happening again. But at some level, I could relate to what was going on with my patients. You see, I understood that their choices, their opportunities, their outcomes were in large part determined by their circumstances. Now, mind you, these patient stories come from Indiana, a state that prides itself on job creation, a state that works. Unemployment is at record lows in Indiana, and while I was trying to figure out how to get my patients out of the hospital revolving door, I learned in my other role as head of the state health department and a member of the governor's cabinet that the chief complaint from Indiana businesses was a limited pool of healthy workers. Against the backdrop of an emerging opioid epidemic, it was difficult to find job applicants who could pass a drug test. Those who were drug-free, they were often obese, or they smoked, or they would forego health-promoting interventions like flu shots and cancer screenings. And these employees, in turn, they had more absences, lower productivity, and skyrocketing health care costs. Not just in Indiana, but nationwide, almost one in five dollars our economy generates now goes to pay for health care expenses. And these dollars, they're not just diverted from company profits, they're diverted from critical funding priorities, like job creation, like wage increases, and like research and development. And that time in my life, while addressing the individual health of my patients and also the public and economic health of a state, was a time in my life when a light bulb went off for me. You see, I realized the problems I faced with my own patients and the concerns that businesses had with workforce all had something in common. They're more often than not the results of environments and inequities that make it increasingly difficult for people to lead healthy, productive lives. In this reality, it cost us all dearly. Despite a growing U.S. economy, we have millions more unfilled jobs in this country than we have people looking for work. We spend more on health care than any other country. It's not even close. $3.4 trillion. Yet we have some of the highest infant and maternal mortality rates, and some of the lowest life expectancies. Even our military is being affected by the poor health of American communities. Did you know that seven out of 10 of our 18 to 24-year-olds in this country are currently ineligible for military service? They can't pass the physical, can't meet the educational requirements, or have a criminal history. We often think that addressing the upstream social factors that lead to these outcomes will cost too much for our economy, for our businesses, for all of you as taxpayers to afford. But the truth is, we can't afford the status quo. <laughs> 
we can't afford to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, because we all know that's the definition of insanity. So what can we do? Well, we can invest in children and families, not just as social imperatives, but as economic ones. We can support a healthy workforce with policies that increase access to healthy food options, smoke-free communities, and safe, attractive places for physical activity. We can help businesses and communities see the value, the return on investment that comes from supporting childcare and a living wage. Fortunately, across the U.S., businesses and communities are beginning to partner to change their outcomes. Let me give you just one example. A major employer in a small town had so many vacancies that production and expansion were suffering. So Belden Incorporated, in partnership with the community, started offering drug testing to potential employees because so many of their folks were failing the initial drug screen. They guided these folks into treatment and recovery, and then into jobs at their factory. And I had a chance to visit Belden. I learned that the people who completed this program were the hardest working and most loyal employees that the company had. Belden's innovation strengthens the community, it lowers incarceration, and it meets a pressing business need. And there are more examples of communities across the country partnering with businesses to improve the health and well-being of their residents and workforce, like Blue Zones in Fort Worth, Texas, like purpose-built communities in East Lake, Georgia, like health equity zones in Rhode Island. Some are investing in affordable housing and walkability. Others are mentoring young students to develop a pipeline. And this all leads me to the point of my story. When Americans lack the opportunity to reach their full health and economic potential, we all pay the price. We pay in suffering and premature death. We pay in increased health care cost and decreased productivity. And we even pay in terms of our national security. But we won't change individual health or avoid these consequences unless we focus on better community health through better partnerships. By making the case for community health as a pathway to economic prosperity, we foster investment in our communities that not only lifts up population health, but also raises and sustains our collective financial success. Or, to say it in a tweet for the millennials in the audience, <laughs> hashtag health is wealth. You know, I was lucky the health consequences I faced from working in the tobacco fields didn't prevent me from pursuing my dreams. But not everyone who sacrifices health and safety for the sake of finance is so lucky. I often wonder what happened to Johnny, what happened to Mary, after I last saw them in my operating room. But I ask you, imagine a future where Johnny doesn't have to go back to the streets, because there are community resilience and workforce training programs that lead him down a different pathway. Where Mary lives in a smoke-free community and can be a healthy model employee who can support her family. Where a kid from rural Maryland doesn't end up in the hospital or supporting an industry that kills his own grandfather for want of a new pair of sneakers. I invite you all to join me and help me create unbreakable communities. Communities that are built so people can more easily make healthy choices. Where children thrive and where businesses invest in those communities as a way of supporting a healthy workforce and a healthy bottom line. Let's dare to break away from doing the same old thing and instead boldly push our nation towards a radically different, a radically better, and an ultimately unbreakable result. Thank you so much for your attention.